You're most kind. I will bless the Lord at all times, and God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Can I have a witness somewhere in the house? I greet you tonight in the name of the Lord Christ, my liberator and my best friend. I was sitting here ready to break out in not only a sweat, but to get on my knees in these comfortable Korean pillows, get on my knees and say, Lord, thank you, because you brought me from a mighty long way. Tonight, I stand at this sacred desk in this beautiful church and would never have imagined that the Lord would take a Harlem boy and allow him the privilege of coming all the way to Elmhurst, Queens, and to stand before Christian activists and those who have centered their life witness in the work of mission and ministry, and to be a part of this ecumenical international fellowship in behalf of the kingdom of God. Isn't God good? Somebody said that their grandmother used to say to them, don't ever say God is good, son. Say God are good. And so God are good. Can I have a witness? I want to give honor to the organizers and founders of this great work. John Perkins is not only a friend, but he's a mentor of the first magnitude. I just love him. I love the way he works. He's not pretentious. He is the kind of fella that's magnanimous, but also magnetic. And to have an older black man unite with a younger white man in the person of Wayne Gordon, it is a blessing and they exemplify precisely what this conference and what our ministries of reconciliation is all about. The best way to have it happen is to do it. We do not need any more theoreticians. We don't need any more rhetoric. We don't need any more theological jargon and theological hair splitting, denominational divisiveness. What we need is concretization of ministry that breaks the ice, that breaks down the walls that divide us and says we are all one in Christ Jesus. Touch somebody and say we're one in the Lord. Touch somebody else and say we're one in the Lord. To Mac Peer and to the host committee, thank you, and the wonderful people that have made this conference possible. We finally made it to New York. Amen. The, the pastor said the big apple. He was finishing up seminary and giving his life to the big church. He was prepared. He was well connected. He was on the move. The only problem was God threw a ringer in the plans. And he announces in the book that bears his name the hand of the Lord was upon me. I was on my way to the big church, but the Lord took me down to the valley that was full of dry bones. And tonight, for just a moment, I would like to articulate this theme, a valley, a preacher, and some wind. A valley, a preacher and some wind. The prophet tells us that the hand of the Lord was upon him, meaning that there was an intimacy between the God-man and the Creator. And if we would understand ministry, there ought to be a love affair between us and God. 
The valley, the valley, the valley of dry bones. He says, God took me down in the valley and my investigation showed me that the valley was full of bones and he comes back with this statement and the bones were very dry. The valley where you work and witness, Southside Chicago and Lawndale, where you work and witness in Mississippi, in Miami, in Dade County, in Harlem, in the South Bronx, in Bedford Stuyvesant, in El Barrio, the valley. The valley that has become dehumanized and becomes a partner in dehumanizing politics. The valley. The valley where children go to bed hungry at night. The valley where people hide in hallways smoking crack cocaine. The valley where a woman goes to her doctor after losing weight only to find out through tests that she has AIDS and to come home to her boyfriend who just got out of jail to hear him say, honey, I forgot to tell you, but I've had AIDS for eight years. The valley where husbands cheat on wives, and wives cheat on husbands. The valley where preachers prone to push for divisiveness because of their particular denominational slant, believing that some people are saved like them and everybody else is going to hell. Have, have come with me down in the valley. The valley that has cut off hope and has strangled life. Come with me down in the valley where schools don't educate, hospitals don't heal, and where churches don't save. Come with me down in the valley where the, exclusivi the exclusivity of religion doesn't want those kind of people in our kind of church. God forbid they're on public assistance. Worse, God forbid that they're dope fiends. God forbid that they stink. God forbid that they smell of alcohol. God forbid that they have AIDS down in the valley. Hopelessness and despair. And three generations of young people who have not been exposed to the faith because they can't get in. Because the Reverend's got a Cadillac, and the members come in from outside to have their church thing, but they don't want anybody from the community to mess up their walls and to have. Come with me down in the valley. Because the valley is full of dry bones. God has a great sense of humor because those of us who think that we were going to have a cushy career in religion and we were going to be able to make it on the salary and on the, the parsonage allowance and on the benefits, sometimes God flips the script because he's got a valid agenda. And God has some people who he, God, her, decide to select and to send them down into the valley, not because they are necessarily equipped to handle valley business, not because they're all that, not because they have made it, not because they have achieved, but because God wants the valley to mold and shape their character and to let them know that with God, all things are possible. Oh, I got a witness somewhere. God takes this young man with all of the dreams of being successful and all of the possibility of being on top of the world and says, come with me down in the valley and let me inquire of you, son of man, 
son of woman, can these bones live? Help me, Holy Ghost. I, I want you to ask yourself that question every time you go down into your valley. Man, woman, child of God, can these bones live? Every time you get in your car and you drive past the group of young people that's cussing and showing their drawers and have their hat turned backwards and they're sinister looking and they look like they're lost and they look like they're angry, frozen rage, ask yourself the question, can these bones live? Can they live? And please understand Ezekiel. Lord God, thou knowest. After all, God, you're the King of kings and Lord of lords. After all, God, you're the one that gave heavy to the elephant and ugly to the baboon. Ray Baki, thank you. You're the one that gave stripes to the zebra and gave a little black dot on the ladybug, making her both male and female, reproducing her own self. You're, you're the one who gave an elastic neck to the giraffe. And you're the one that gave humanity their symmetry. So, yea, Lord, you know. And God doesn't answer it. Valley, preacher, preacher, prophesy to the bones and say to the bones, let me call a spade a spade. O ye dry bones, hear ye the word of the Lord. Honey, I am not here to condemn you after you struggled all these years trying to raise your children. Yes, you received public assistance. But I'm prophesying to the bones, it's all right that you've gone through trials and tribulations because I want you to know that it's not yet over until it's over. Yes, son, I know you've been in and out of jail. Nobody wants to deal with you. Nobody wants to touch you. Nobody wants to help you. But I want you to know now I'm prophesying to you. I'm letting you know that God is able and we're going to be there to carry you to the GED classes. We're going to be there to meet you in the prison house and to let you know that enough is enough. Prophesy to the bone. I'm waiting for the church to start prophesying. I'm waiting for the church to come out of its lean comfortability and its smug religiosity and to get dirty, to roll up the sleeves and to get down to the nitty gritty. I'm waiting for the church to get involved in the valley and start prophesying. Prophesy to the landlords. Ask them how come these buildings look like crap with graffiti on the walls. How come you haven't come in and cleaned up the building? How come there's garbage on the street? Prophesy. How come, Mr. Principal, your school has such low reading levels and your children are demoralized? And by the time they get to the 11th grade or the 10th grade, they drop out because they feel no challenge. They feel no, nobody cares about them, that their brain is wasted because of your attitude of racism. Prophesy. And the church, my beloved, it's our time in the new millennium to start a prophetic movement, to call into question the injustices of this society, the racism, the classism, the narcissism, the nationalism, and the ageism. We're looking for somebody to stand up and be an advocate for AIDS. People that are willing to even be identified, maybe people even to say, you must have AIDS. Why are you so passionate about AIDS? I'm passionate about AIDS because AIDS is a scourge on this society and this world. Prophesy. 
man tonight, Ezekiel. What he shows me is what it means to be obedient. You got about five more minutes? He shows me what it means to be obedient. To recognize the fact that when all is said and done, the agenda of kingdom building is not ours. You may go ahead and start a ministry. You may go ahead and be a part of a ministry. You may go ahead and be a part of a design that comes out of your brain, that comes out of your intelligence, that comes from your space of, of economic and social privilege. But let me tell you something. Ezekiel got the mandate from the Lord. And when God gives you a mandate, you've got to respond and say, yes, Lord, let your will be done. He says to the prophet, come with me and let's walk around the bones. Let's take a look. Because, you know, most of us don't want to look. We, we don't want to look at the ugliness. We want to have a religion that shouts. We want a religion that only focuses on the Psalms, celebration. We want a religion that does not deal with ugliness and with pain and with domestic violence and with drug addiction. We want a religion that makes us feel good, that becomes a palliative for our own religious commitments and concerns. We, God forbid, if we ever had a chance to move in the realm of becoming prophetic and dealing with the issue of justice and being willing to take risks and being willing to be scandalized and criticized in the community because the fellas in the pulpit don't like us because we stand where God would stand in a compassionate concern ministry to those who are being stomped on and for those who are being cursed. I was at the minister's conference. They invited me to come and speak about the issue of AIDS. A sister by the name of Pernessa Seal pulled my coat to the reality that AIDS would become an international pandemic. I did not know at the time how this short little lady would, why she would even bother to come and talk about something that I didn't know anything about. And because I didn't know anything about it, that meant it wasn't a possibility that it existed. I thought she was out of her mind. And I always attract people that are kind of, you know, on the border. Straight dogs find me. Uh, you know, people that are kind of like, in, you know, it might be necessary for them to get a little Thorazine or something. You know, they find me. So she stood outside my office. I had a million and one things to do. And she said, you know what, preacher? You're a young man, you're here in Harlem. I'm not leaving till you hear my story. I said, go girl. She came into my office, boom, and she's, she said, may, well, may I have a seat? And I said, sure. I said, but listen, I'm fifty. let me tell you, I don't, I'm not gonna hear that. I work for Harlem Hospital's epidemiology department and there's a problem that our community is going to have. It's called AIDS. Centers for Disease Control keep reporting that even from the beginning of this disease, it was not a gay men's issue only, a gay white man. It was an issue in the African American and Latino communities as well, from the beginning. But the statistics was moved from race identification and culture identification and ethnic identification to become a lump sum figure so the gay white community mobilized. And she was trying to explain to me. I said, well, it's a gay white, you know, it's all of our problems. And if the churches don't speak about it, then we're gonna be lost. She said, you know, there are pastors that won't allow people with AIDS that have died to be funeralized in their churches. Women who sacrificed and gave their tithes and offerings and cooked in the kitchen and had bus rides for the church when their son realized that he had contracted AIDS and he was gay, pastors said, send him to the funeral home. She told me, it's a disgrace in the name of God. Vanessa was down in the valley. She said, I tell you what, if you want to be redeemed, I 
want you to become a principal advocate as a minister of the gospel and stand in solidarity with men and women and children that have AIDS. I said, my God, I'm being put in a position with this little woman who's feisty and very demanding, and she's going to now tell me that I got to stand in solidarity with people with AIDS. I'm not even clear what it is. I know it's debilitating and destructive, but now, and I realized what it was. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And she was calling me, come down to the valley of dry bones. Now, when you prophesy to the bones, I'm almost through. When you prophesy to the bones with conviction, when you prophesy to the bones without allurement and without technical, sophisticated methodologies, that are not so connected. When you rely upon the book, not the Bible, the book, and the procedures of strategic planning and program planning, and not concerned about the hearts and the souls of people, then there'll be no connectedness. But when there is a sincerity in the message, and the partnership in ministry not to do for but to do with then something remarkable begins to happen the old black preachers talked about the fact that the bones in the environment of prophecy started coming together they said that the toe bones got connected to the foot bone can i have a witness and the foot bone got connected to the ankle bone and the ankle bone got connected to the leg bone and the leg bone got connected to the thigh bone and the thigh bone got connected to the hip bone and the hip bone got connected to the spine bone or something like that and the and they put all the bones together And it's good for bones to come together. It's good to provide housing for the homeless. It's good to have a shelter for those who have been left outside. It's good to have a soup kitchen. That's putting the bones together. But as I take my leave, listen, Christian builders. The Bible says that that's not the complete process. There needs to be flesh that is a humanness restored to disembodied bones there needs to be an appreciation for the diversity of the human family and therefore the diversity goes even down to the reality of the struggles of people who have been humiliated and rejected and left outside the wall and an appreciation that blesses life and the reality that our struggle has not been in vain. When they come stinking, disorientated, angry, frustrated, mean-spirited, and sometimes downright disrespectful, please don't shut your door. Please don't push them aside. Understand that it's a desire not only for the bones to come together, but they're seeking to put some flesh, some humanity on their life, and they're just reaching out to you, reaching out to your ministry, reaching out to your church, reaching out to your family, reaching out to somebody that will just listen and show some compassion and some concern. Somebody say hallelujah. I said the valley. Sociologically, it is a place of disruption. Economically, it is a place of challenge. Spiritually, it is bankrupt. And the preacher, the preacher, not just the formal preacher, the seminary trained preacher, but somebody, some housewife, some husband, some 
father, some teacher, some social worker, some Christian organist, somebody to rise up and say enough is enough. We are no longer going to tolerate this insanity. We are going to be spokespersons for the living God because we know that in an environment where hope is announced, where prophecy is announced, and where love is demonstrated, the world will be a much better place. the vision of the black preachers putting the bones together but let me tell you not just flesh but finally God says now let's bring this process to completion prophesy to the winds the wind the ruah the power of God in creation prophesy to the winds the pneuma of the New Testament the life bringing power of the Spirit of God. Prophesy to the winds, preacher, and say to the north wind, blow. Say to the south wind, blow. Say to the east wind, blow. Say to the west wind, I ain't messing with this one, blow. And when the wind blows, when the wind becomes like a rushing mighty wind, when the wind blows, something begins to happen. Our life lifeless and lackluster worship begins to take on new meaning. We come to church and nobody has to beg us to sing the hymns of Zion. We don't mind clapping our hands and patting our feet and shedding a tear every now and then when the wind begins to blow. When the wind blows, our community development corporations are no longer just doing good social work, but we're doing ministry in the power of the spirit. Junkies throw down their needles, abusing men confess their sins. Oh, grocery store owners serving inferior meals to the people in the community begin to say, I'll change the products on the shelf and when the wind blows the wind blows through this conference this week it's going to revive us it's going to renew us it's going to revamp us it's going to restore us it's going to revive us because the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit makes the difference I got to go but let me tell you this, I needed a break. And somebody suggested that I should go to Graymore in upstate New York, a Baptist preacher from Harlem, to go to Graymore, which is run by Franciscan friars, the guys with the long robes and the rope and the big cross. And I said to them, he got to be crazy. What am I going? because the prejudice of the Baptist toward Catholics. My pastor gave me a book when I was ready to marry my, my wife, Why Roman Catholics and Baptists and Protestants Should Not Marry. It's deep. And my wife drove me up there and she said, boy, this is a strange place. Where's the friars? And one of them passed by. I said, there's one. She said, but look at all these people. They look like they're homeless. They look grubby. And of course, after they took my bags out, and I'm looking for a Holiday Inn in the, in the spirit, the, 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 the castle on top of the hill where the fry, they said, oh no, Reverend, you going here. So I go inside, and there's an 83-year-old Franciscan friar by the name of Father Angel, and he's sitting there, and he's looking this way, and my chair is here, and I'm waiting to see his eyes, and he looks at me, and his eyes are twinkling. And he says, um, ooh, we don't have very many of your kind here. And I got immediately insulted. I said, what do you mean? There's a lot of black people here. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about arrogant Baptist preachers. <laughs> he said, while you're here, you know what your role will be? 
I said, well, this guy got a nerve. He said, to become humble. He said, you know what humble means? I said, what well, it means to be, me. he said, no, it means to be teachable. He said, your assignment, everybody has to have an assignment here. First of all, you're not living up there you know, with the friars. You're going to live down here with 125 homeless men. Two months. Really, he said three, but I cut it. I'm, I'm finished. And he said, what I want you to do is you're going to work up there in the friars headquarters, and two of the three meals, you're going to be a waiter for two months. And every day, I had to climb the hill from the homeless shelter with these guys that came out of jail, some of the guys with big, rough, gruff, and Pastor Washington, took a sabbatical leave of absence from his church and HCCI is now living in a homeless shelter and serving food in the kitchen. And I, after the first month and a half, I was coming down the hill one night, I was tired, and I start cussing. Holy cussing. <laughs> and I told the Lord, I don't understand this. I was trying to take a break. I was trying to hang out with the Franciscan Friars and somebody, and now I'm living with all these homeless men, and they're paranoid, and they got all kind of problems. What's going on? And I'm screaming and hollering. I get to the little tiny locker with all my possessions in it, trying to squeeze my coat in, and I'm slamming doors. And finally, some of the fellas that was working up in the kitchen with me, they said, Brother Preston, did you see it? And by that, I want to hear nothing about no seeing nothing. We had just served quail and big bottles of wine. You know, they like drinking wine. And I, that, what do you mean, did I see it? Leave me. They said, Brother Preston, calm down. We heard you cussing, coming down the hill. Thought you was a preacher. He said, did you see it? I said, no, I didn't see it. They said, while you were cussing and looking down at the ground, feeling sorry for yourself, the homeless brother said, there was a comet that lit across the sky. He said it was so magnificent because it lit up the entire sky. And he said, you missed it. Brother Preston, because you need My brothers and my sisters, things may get dire down in the valley. Things may become rough, but look up. It may seem like things are not going your way and program money may not come your way. It may seem like the community does not appreciate what you do, but look up. Look up because there's a light in the sky and his name is Jesus. He is the light of the world. He is a lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the rose of Sharon. He's my best friend. Somebody say yes. Wow. I don't know how you follow. Uh that uh, last gift to all of us of inspiring uh, reminders. But I am really happy to be here tonight. Um, I am happy to be able to share, and I am happy to be able to think of John and Vera Mae Perkins and the celebration that we did this noon of their 50 years of marriage, their 40 years their 40 years of ministry and John's 70th birthday. So I think we just need to celebrate that all over again tonight. And I think both John and Vera May would be the first to say that they hope that we celebrate the God who stands behind them and who inspired them and who made all of that possible. And what a gift they've been to all of us in our ministries and in our inspirations. You know, I've been in the 
urban work for 35 years on the west side of Chicago. But I don't feel no ways tired. Come too far from where we started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. But I don't believe God brought us this far to leave us. I don't feel no ways tired. And tonight we want to celebrate that this is the gathering of the folks who are over that first hill and the folks who are coming to begin the hill and what a joy it is to see young people here uh, in the midst of the rest of us and working together for this. I want to celebrate tonight too another boundary that has been crossed because you know when I first came to CCDA in those beginning years there were very few of us women in leadership positions. And sometimes we had to tweak John a little bit to remind him about that boundary that needed to be crossed. And he did it with great humor and, and great uh, uh, willingness to be open to us uh, women who had a few extra things to say. But I want to say I am really pleased to, and thankful to Dr. Lee because, you know, CCDA has too often been seen as a black and white organization. And in today's world, we really need to be an organization that crosses the boundaries of Asians and Latinos and Native Americans and, and the world. And I want to celebrate tonight that we are the beginning on that journey of crossing that boundary as well. And that's the exciting thing. It's, it's getting us out of our comfort zones and moving in across these boundaries and trying to make things happen. And you know, uh, I have a brother and his wife who adopted 11 children and had three born to them. And uh, five are African Americans and two are Korean and one is uh, Vietnamese and one's Native American and so forth and so on. And they say, we don't have family fights, we have race riots. And what a joy it is to be able to be together as the body of Christ and to be even to think about the fact that we can cross these boundaries uh, in terms of this. Well, you know, 35 years ago, uh, my brother and I uh, moved into the west side of Chicago. Uh, and three days after we arrived there, the first riot took place. And the Sunday my brother was installed, the National Guard troops uh, were on the street and the tanks were, tanks were rumbling by so that nobody could hear what was going inside on inside of this little church and what was left in a little church in a community that had changed from white to black in a two-year process were 35 elderly white people and as we that Sunday morning celebrated uh, the new start to that church and you know it, we started with the riot and a couple of good things happened because of that. We never got so bothered with women's groups and men's groups, and, but we, it got pushed us out into the neighborhood right away uh, to be on the street, to be knocking on doors, to try to be the church. And the second thing I can say that it's been a riot ever since, that God got rid of all the falderall, all of those things that so often make us so busy that we forget the essence of what we're really about. So it's been an exciting journey these 35 years of seeing what God could do just with a little bunch of people that so many of the rest of the world had written off and said nothing good can come out of that place. And we had no resources and we thought we had no talents, but you know asset-based community development, you discover the gifts in people, you discover the assets of your community. And so when the banks all turned us down way back in those days before the Community Reinvestment Act challenges, the banks all turned us down and this congregation looked what was the only asset it had to, to collateralize a loan. And that was this church building that was free and clear of debt. And so that congregation voted to mortgage that church building as collateral for the loans that started us on our housing ministry. And that was the step of freedom, you know? Again, we weren't worried about our church building and whether we were gonna keep it up because we were willing to put at risk the most precious thing we had at that point, which was our church building. And God has ways of freeing us up. 
uh, when we uh, try and move in those directions. But you know, this evening uh, they said I could speak on anything I wanted to. And that's a very dangerous thing uh, for somebody like uh, myself. And it reminds me of uh, my mother, who was a passionate uh, public speaker and passionate about peace uh, and uh, the stop of the nuclear proliferation. In fact, she put her body in a little boat in front of a Trident nuclear submarine uh, out in the Puget Sound there in those waters that could have killed her if she had jumped into that. She believed that passionately about it. Well, she was asked to speak uh, when she was over 70. She was asked to speak on sex and aging. And um, she said, nuclear warfare is not good for sex or aging. And began to talk about her passion. So tonight, I am going to talk about what's passionate on my heart. And you know, this uh, past year, we, many people were riveted to their TV screens once a week when that TV show, Survivors, came on. And you know, the paradigm, the, the reflection of America that that show, Survivors, was all about was, and I think we're going to probably have to name the winner of this presidential campaign, the Survivor, uh, as well. But the paradigm of that show was a voting people off of the island, right? Voting them off one by one, week by week, who couldn't make it. And there were all kinds of little schemes and all kinds of little clusters of people in terms of that. It was a winner and loser situation. And it was a winner take all situation and pitted people against people. And that was the, it kept us glued to the television set to find out who was going to make it, who was the winner of all of this. Well, I want to say tonight that CCDA and what we are about is the reversal, is a very different paradigm from that. It is a counter-culture counter paradigm where Jesus invites all to come into the circle, invites us to vote everybody in and to make way for those people. And our work is loving people into the circle of power, of sharing the credits, of sharing the concerns. And we want to vote everyone in and enable them to be a part of making things happen. So tonight I want to talk about turning survivors into revivers. Revivers. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do it by staying connected. And first of all, we need to stay connected to God, okay, to keep our core right, to keep our values right, to keep our vision right of this welcoming into the circle, of this capacity to, to revive the situation around us, to have this different paradigm that's there. And we need to stay close to God, to stay connected to God through prayer. And it is those kinds of prayers that help us make sure that we are on the right track. And you know, so often, you know that song, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want, right? You know, and that, that's a connection that never gets disconnected. It's never busy. It is always open and always there and available. We, uh, a couple of weeks, or the night before the elections, we called through every voter in two wards on the west side of Chicago. And I was amazed at how many disconnected phone lines that there really were. And we couldn't get the message of a cross of how important it was to go out and vote that next day. Disconnected lines. But the thing we can celebrate with God is that those lines are never busy. They're never disconnected. And that's where we get our marching orders and to make that happen. I have a sister-in-law who gets up at 4.30 every morning and she prays. And she prays for an hour and a half at least for every one of us and for all of the concerns and for all of the people. And that power, I just know that power is what has kept us through in these years, is what has moved us forward because praying people. And you may have some folks in your group who, 
who don't seem to have many other gifts, but they may be the giftedness of prayers. They may be the ones who can keep lifting up when we forget in our busyness to take that time to do that. And you know, sometimes when we pray, we have got to be careful about the results of those prayers because God doesn't always do it the way we want it, but God does answer prayers. And I remember the time when we were going to a bank to get a loan and we had a federal grant that required us to have the bank's uh, commitment letter uh, to make this money possible. And we had gotten a, a preliminary letter from the bank and then the Fed said, well, you need this firm commitment from this bank in order for us to release this money. And so we had gone and they said we had to have it in Washington by Monday morning. And so on Friday, we had gone to the bank and said, bank, we need this letter, firm commitment, not just a nice letter of interest. And the bank acted totally surprised and said, well, we can't possibly make this firm commitment uh, to you and we can't possibly do it uh, by Monday morning. And so we, got, we went home and cried, first of all. Uh, and then on Saturday, we got mad, okay? And so we looked up who was on the board of directors of that bank and we, uh, gathered and made phone calls on Saturday and Sunday morning in church we had an altar call and the congregation came to the front and we got down on our knees and we said God you know we're just trying to get affordable housing in our neighborhood and we're trying so hard and it just seems like this door is closed on us but if you want this to happen you're going to work, work a mighty way and you're going to make this happen. So we were mad and we prayed and Monday morning we gathered in the coffee shop across the street from the bank and uh, had our little schemes ready and who was going to say what and what were we going to do and the president and so forth. And we had called a couple of people who knew some people on the board ahead of time because God wants us to do our homework too. Um, and the, the bank employees who were at that little coffee shop got kind of nervous because here was this raggle scraggle group of people. And we went across the bank. Well, it just so happened that that morning, the mayor was coming out to that bank to celebrate this bank's wonderful investments in the community. And they had just turned us down. And so when we went to the vice president of the bank and said, we need this letter, and here's the draft, and here's all of our background support and all of this, and the man got very nervous. I can't possibly do anything. The mayor is here, and, and we're going to have this ceremony. So we went and stood right in the front row of that ceremony when the mayor got up and said how wonderful this bank was. And right after the ceremony, we ran to the bank. We ran to the mayor and said, Mayor, we need your help. Would you tell the president of the bank that we need this letter for a loan and a grant that the city is, is helping us to push through, uh, and we need it today? And so the mayor brought this raggle-scraggle route to the bank president, and he was sweating by then. And, um, and said, well, I, I really want you to do this, and I'm going to call back this afternoon to see if it got all worked out. And he said, yes, uh, yes, Mayor, uh, yes. And uh, so then the president ran, and we ran right after him. And we got in the elevator together, our raggle-scraggle group in this bank president. And wouldn't you know, the elevator stopped between the second and third floor. And 45 minutes later, when they unhooked the elevator, the bank president ran to his office and wrote the letter that we needed. God has a way of answering prayers, even uh, whether it's stopping elevators or having mayors out at those moments. But we have to be careful. But we need to stay connected to God. And prayer is the easiest and best way to do it. The second thing is that we need to stay connected to each other. And you know, that's the gift of CCDA. This connections, when we have our board meetings, most of the time we don't even spend time on our business, but we spend time sharing. And that's the gift that you have in this week together, of sharing with each other, of upholding each other, of praying for each other, of getting great ideas from each other of being able to connect through email and the phone and all the rest of that um, in staying connected. And that's what's really going to make a difference to each other. You know, the spiritual goes, sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain, 
But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again, and that's what this is all about, these times together. And the third thing is to be to turn from survivors to revivors. We need to stay connected to people. And we do that through justice. You know, sometimes, I mean, I've been in the community. I live and work and worship in our community. And yet sometimes I, too, get isolated from what's going on out on the streets, even though I have to walk through things. And on my way to church, I walk through drug dealers uh, to get to church and, and all of the rest of that. We get disconnected. We're so busy in our programs and people coming to us, we get disconnected from the very people we are there to serve. We are there to encourage. We are there to stand with and stand by. And I think of that um, when we've done our prayer, or when we've done our Take Back the Streets campaigns each fall, and we go on marches, you know, down with drugs and up, down with dope and up with hope and, and do all those things. When we walk through those streets and, and leaflet people, they say, man, don't tell me about all that. I need a job. Or, you know, man, this school is the pits, and, and my kids need this and my need that. We need to stay connected to where people are at and what is on their minds and, and what are their concerns, and we need to get out of our offices and out of our programs at really strong intervals. The best thing that ever happened to us at Bethel Church was when we started, and we do at least a couple times a year prayer vigils, and sometimes they go all through the night. And we used to have them inside our church building because it was scary out there. There are gunshots and there are uh, sirens and there are people walking the streets that make you scared and all the rest of it. And we used to have them in our church building. But you know when we moved them out to the street corner and stayed all night on those street corners, when we became vulnerable, that's when we were able to, with God's spirit, we were able to touch lives, people who came and asked for help people who asked for prayers, people who gave testimony to God's power in their lives. When we connect with the people, God can use us, that vulnerability and that opportunity, and we need to be able to do that. You know, the whole healthcare field has changed nowadays. People used to come to hospitals. Well, the whole healthcare field has changed so much that hospitals are having to go out into communities and talk about healthy communities because the scene has changed. It has changed for our churches as well. We need to think about how do we get out of our buildings, not be captive to our buildings and to where the people are, where the hurts are, where the things need to happen. We need to stay connected to the people. And I want to thank Shane, um, who is on our board of directors and CCDA, a young man who, who believes the radical nature of Jesus and who wrote uh, recently an article in the Other Side magazine where he, he talked about this disconnect, holding each other, of praying for each other, of getting great ideas from each other, of being able to connect through email and the phone and all the rest of that um, in staying connected. And that's what's really going to make a difference to each other. You know, the spiritual goal is sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. And that's what this is all about, these times together. And the third thing is to, be, to turn from survivors to revivors. We need to stay connected to people. And we do that through justice. You know, sometimes, I mean, I've been in the community. I live and work and worship in our community. And yet sometimes I, too, get isolated from what's going on out on the streets, even though I have to walk through things. And on my way to church, I walk through drug dealers uh, to get to church and, and all of the rest of that. We get disconnected. We're so busy in our programs and people coming to us, we get disconnected from the very people we are there to serve. We are there to encourage. He didn't just give some money to the poor. He was poor. He was walked that road uh, and made that happen. And so Shane and, and so many of the young people, I, I, I always say I need young people around. We need young people around us because the older I get, and you can see I'm pretty old, 
Uh, the older I get, the more I know we tried that and it didn't work. And young people don't know that. And half the times when they try it, if we give them permission to try it anyway, it works. And so even our forms of worship, even our styles of doing things may become very different if we stay connected to the people and if we allow young people to try and do some things differently in their mode, in their medium, uh, and to make that reaching happen. So we need to stay connected to the people. Now I want you to walk with me through this next thought because it's a difficult one. And Shane brings it up in his article, and Dr. Hilfiker at the, um, um, at the Jubilee um, and Good Samaritan Inns in Washington, D.C., just wrote another article about it, saying that if we're really going to be connected to the people, that maybe sometimes our good programs and our efforts to help them get a meal and a bed and a place to stay, maybe those efforts are the wrong thing. Now walk me through down this one, okay? It's because it's tough for us to hear. That maybe what we're doing is dulling with the immediate answer to their needs. We're dulling the passion for justice that resides in the heart of every person. Maybe we're dulling it because we're doing things that give some immediate relief but don't really answer the full problems. I don't know, I know that we have to ask those questions. And if we're really going to stay connected, we have to be willing to have that, that passion about justice come bubbling up and disrupt all our programs and, and set aside all our other kinds of things uh, to really make that happen. You know, CCDA talks about that. If you feed a person, they'll eat for a day, and if you teach them to fish, they'll They'll uh, eat for a lifetime, but then you want to teach them to own the pond. And now that's the revolutionary part, right, uh, to make that happen. So as we think about staying connected to the people and to this whole matter of justice, I'm reminded of a little boy who was concerned when he was out in the woods, he saw some traps and some birds that had gotten caught in those traps. And so he went home and he prayed and he said, oh God, please keep the birds away from those traps. And he went out the next day, and more birds were caught in those traps. And then he took away the, the little uh, goodies, the little food that was in those traps, and he said, well, maybe this will help. And he went back home, and he prayed again, and, and he said, Lord, keep these birds away from these traps. And they went out the next day, and there were some more birds. And finally, he removed the traps. And so it seems to me that if we're going to really stay connected, we have got to take some time and some effort to think about removing the traps. And you know what the traps are. If you think about Jonathan Kozel's book, Savage Inequality, which simply described that our present system of financing public education is such that the, that the injustice, that the lack of equality in our public schools will go on into perpetuity. And you know what happens to a young person who doesn't have a chance at a computer, who doesn't have a teacher that has the, the textbooks and the other opportunities and, and have the gleam in the eye. We are damning that generation to low wages and to unemployment and to all of these other things. We have got to leave some time and effort from our programs to, to be about this question of removing the traps in very special kinds of way. You know, there's a... Uh, in the, you know, and, and we could take heart from the whole civil rights movement. And you know, it was the young people who had the courage to sit down and to sit in and to be persistent in that. And we need to think about what are the things and where is the energy coming from and can we be supportive of those efforts to remove the traps in this day and age. There's a movement that's calling for the people of faith to join together to overcome poverty, and it's called a call to renewal. And it is an effort to say, in this age of prosperity, it is a moral shame to have the kind of poverty in this country as it is, and that as God's people, we cannot just sit back and let that go on. And so it's a movement to call us out, all of us, to work together beyond the boundaries 
and to work together in our state houses and in a national voice and in our efforts to remove that yoke of injustice and to make uh, to take away those things. Now, oh, there are so many opportunities to do that. There are so many opportunities. And you know this great uh, uh, book uh, from the American Bible Society, those Bible passages, is Justice Now. And if you ever need a real primer on how clear the Bible is about the demand for being about this work of justice, it's right here. And it, it says, as we think about a new, uh, a new uh, uh, administration, you are doomed, it says, you make unjust laws that oppress my people. That is how you keep the poor from having their rights and from getting justice, Isaiah 10. The Bible is replete with the demand for us to take the time and to really be about that work of justice. And there are so many issues, the health care issues of access to health care and, and raising the minimum wage and, and predatory lending and payday lending and the savage inequality in the financing of schools and uh, the environmental uh, justice and all of these kinds of things. And yes, I know we're working night and day and we don't have any time, but we have got to make time within what we do to not simply put band-aids on the problems, but to be a part of energizing and involving folks and involving all of us in this passion for justice. So. We want to t turn from survivors to revivors, and to do that, we need to stay connected to God, to each other, and to people. And this revival is about the work of justice, about a giving, a getting a government that would see itself as an instrument of justice and not in the special interests and the, the other things that we see so replete. And so tonight, as we close, I want to ask those of you that are ready and willing to step out into some uncomfortable turf. And I just want to read a quote from Shane's article, and I understand he's going to be speaking to you next year in Dallas, this young man who has such a clarity of vision around this. He said, people do not get crucified for charity. People are crucified for living out a love that disrupts the social order that calls forth a new world. People are not crucified for helping poor people. People are crucified for joining them. And so tonight, for those of you who are able and those of you who are willing to say, we're going to join, we're going to get into that uncomfortable turf, we're going to stay connected to God and to each other and to people, um, I want you to join hands in justice and in action. And if you are ready to make these commitments, and if you are able, I'd ask you to stand. And I'd ask you to join hands so we can stay connected. You know, Jesus said that a small group of disciples could turn the whole world upside down think of the power in this room to bring about justice in this land, to, to stand with and to make a difference. So let us pray together as we hold hands. Revive us, Lord, to be about the work of justice in our communities and in our land. Turn us from survivors to revivors. Help us push open the circle so that all might experience the dignity and the opportunity and the justice. And Lord, in this work, and it's not easy, keep us connected to God, to each other, and to other people so that we might be about your work of justice in the land. Let the people say amen. <laughs>